Ricky, it's great to see you. Thanks, thanks for meeting with me today. Thanks for um, inviting me, Chris. I'm I'm Chris Wisnia. I'm here with Ricky Sprague. We are the team that brings you uh, Doris Danger, Giant Monsters Amok, uh, which just came out this week from Fanagraphics, and uh, I am thrilled that that we got this to happen. Ricky, uh, I, I think uh, one, one thing we can talk about a little is how uh, I signed this contract over three years ago. And for the last three years, I think both of us have been saying, can you believe this? Did we pull one over on them? Are, are they really <laughs> going to publish this? <laughs> yeah, some variation on that. Uh, I I was confident that the book would appear. I was not as confident that it would appear in color. Um, I, I don't know how much you want to talk about uh, contractual stuff or, you know, behind the scenes business kind of stuff. But uh, as you alluded to, it did take there was there was quite a bit of time between signing a contract and getting it out. And uh, in that time, I had I had plenty of time to think uh, you know, if they actually do publish this in color, it's it's going to be amazing, and it's it's also going to be so just warped. I I, I mean, like <laughs> I I was kind of uh, I I was not convinced until I actually saw it that it was going to to appear with these amazing colors you know which <laughs> did so much to uh, uh advance the i i don't know the theme the you know the uh, on a meta textual level the the colors are you know kind of important and also you know just outlandish and uh, <laughs> you know, not not the kind of thing that I might expect a reputable publisher to uh, to go ahead and actually <laughs> do. So, yeah, let let let's uh, go way back and and discuss all this. But before we do, I I think we should both share our T-shirt choices today. I I wanted to show you a shirt I got from Kohl's, K O H L, mm. actual. Jack Kirby giant monster comic, uh, which is what Doris Danger is parodying. And in fact, I, I mm. believe I swiped a, a variation of this exact image uh, in, in the book. Uh, Looks kind of familiar. Yeah. When when you stood up to make some adjustments before we recorded, I saw you had uh, a, a good T-shirt choice. <laughs> Abloya. I think that's uh, that's Dr. DeBunko. Right. Yes. Yes. A, yeah. A, a very talented, but uh, uh, only semi-famous uh, comics creator uh, invented <laughs> Dr. DeBunko from uh, Tabloya. I mean, people, uh, you know, readers of Doris Danger will recognize Tabloya, I'm sure, if if not necessarily Dr. DeBunko. Although I bet there's a lot of crossover between <laughs> Doris Danger readers and Dr. DeBunko <laughs> readers. So for those not in the know, uh, Tabloia Weekly Magazine is a fictional uh, pseudo tabloid magazine that I created. And uh, Doris Danger is a feature of Tabloia Weekly Magazine. And and so the, the new graphic novel, uh, Ricky mentioned it's meta. And it's meta in that she is a photojournalist trying to prove the existence of giant monsters, but she works for Tabloia magazine. And 20 years ago, I created Tabloia magazine as an actual comic book with Doris as a backup feature in that magazine. And then over time, I just continued doing the Doris Danger stories. Uh, this Fanagraphics book is the first full color version of her adventures that I've published. And uh, so I, I was going to talk a little about how Ricky and I met. 
uh, do you remember our, our first meeting? Uh, well, it would have been our first face-to-face -face meeting. It would have been at a convention. Uh, which, which was it? Was it a, was it a Wizard World LA or I think San so. Diego? I think so. And I, mm. our, our mutual friend, uh, Dan Hart, a, a hilarious, fun fella, uh, mm. who I went to college with, was working with you at the time, right? And as, as mm -hmm. I remember it, he told me, hey, I've got this buddy and uh, he's into comics and stuff. And uh, he lives down here in LA and uh, he's, he's gonna try and come hunt you down at, at this convention. And uh, at, at the time you were doing uh, some writing for Cracked Magazine, is that right? Uh, Cracked, I think, was defunct at that time. I, I had done some stuff for Mad Magazine, okay. uh, you know, a little later. Uh, that was around the time they had their big 50th anniversary issue. Mm -hmm. It's a long time ago. And I, I did have an article in that. I, you know, I worked, I, I did some stuff for Mad, not a, not a ton of stuff. But be, yeah, before that, I had published a lot of stuff in uh, the late lamented Cracked magazine i guess mad is now late and lamented <laughs> as well uh but <laughs> were you responsible for these companies going under <laughs> uh it was a delayed reaction to to my appearing it was not an immediate effect i i guess my my appearances were like little time bombs little <laughs> little booby traps and eventually yeah everything that i appear in uh defuncts so do you remember if you had read or seen any of my stuff before we met or did you just pick it up at, at that meeting no i i think that 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 would have been the first time that i actually read any of your stuff so you, you uh, just kindly picked some stuff up and kindly also read it <laughs> right and also, I, I think, kindly enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like so. we, we hit it off pretty quick and fast. Uh, a lot of similar sensibilities and enjoyment of uh, pop culture tastes. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you, and you, yeah. Some, uh, you, you know, comics history, uh, you... I, you probably know more about comics history than I do, and I know more about comics history than, you know, the vast majority of the, the population, uh, for whatever that's worth. Uh, <laughs> so we had that in common. We had some, uh, I would say some, uh, you know, I don't know, some cultural uh, affinities as well. And... Uh, I, I yeah, if we both enjoy uh, th those deep dives into uh, kind of to, to the public obscure. Yeah, uh, I, I think both of us uh, can be pretty obsessive mm -hmm. at times, mm -hmm. uh, maybe even a bit ultraist in our uh, in affinity for and appreciation for very obscure things and also uh i i would also say uh pursuit uh, obscure pursuits maybe <laughs> uh you know like art artist obscure artistic pursuits uh like you know just a dedication to following through on things that we really really like that maybe might not have a a mass appeal but uh you know that we just keep following through on so yeah yeah i mean there's uh you know i would say uh you know temperamentally artistically yeah we're we're pretty similar in a lot of ways yeah and so uh our our winding up collaborating for doris danger uh it it took a, a few steps to, to get to the point of you, you coloring this book. And the, the first step was that you had been doing animation and uh, you, you 
toured around with with a film at some animation uh, festivals, mm -hmm. and um, I was considering trying to do some kind of Doris Danger animation, and uh, so that that was our first sort of Doris Danger collaboration with you producing uh, the animated snippets which wound up being all the teaser trailers I've recently posted up on uh, my YouTube channel. Mm. Uh, what, what do you remember about us doing those? Uh, well, I, I remember spending a lot of time thinking about, uh, you know, those, uh, what was it called? The Marvel superheroes, something with that really that that animation where they just traced it from the comic books they you know they traced and i i think that was one reason why jack kirby left marvel at, <laughs> at that time you know because he was annoyed they were they were using his artwork in these in these really limited animations poorly and done yeah yeah like just the, the sometimes the animation would just be dragging the cell in front of the you know the camera and we thought uh we thought it would be funny if we did a you know a version of that like there was you know the idea being that they had done a uh, you know a doris danger television show in the you know i i don't know early to mid 60s where they just took the uh, and that that's literally what i did you know, yeah, I, we, I took your artwork. Occasionally, I would add something. Uh, you know, it was drawn in such a way to show that it was definitely not part of the original comic. But I just took your images and cut them up and, you know, animated them. And the results, I thought, were, I mean, particularly if you know the Marvel you, you know that that crummy marvel show that they did i i think the results are just ab absolutely hilarious you know and uh so yeah we put to, i i mean i spent a lot of time putting those they were a lot of fun they were they were really a lot of fun uh to do um i enjoyed i got a lot of uh mental and creative exercise out of doing them so, uh, yeah, and it was, you know, putting them with the, you know, those those sound effects and the, the voices and, uh, you know, everything. I, I think it, it's kind of a, uh, for, again, for a, a certain audience, it, it's, uh, you know, kind of a celebration of, uh, you know, a, a fairly obscure part of animation and comics history. <laughs> It's true. I, I forget that I, I always say, oh, this all makes perfect sense to me. And I, I lose track of all the steps we go through to get there. And I lose track of how not everyone has uh, seen a lot of these obscure references, references we make. But uh, mm. yeah, that, that, that's absolutely true. We, we were saying, OK, Tabloid Weekly Magazine is, is a cheap newspaper just out to make a quick buck uh they don't care about quality and so if, if we're gonna do an animation let's see what what would be a good inspiration for uh a, a company like that right oh mm -hmm. well let's look at the marvel cartoons that were so awful and mm -hmm. uh, you you brought up you know you'll see a person standing and their their legs won't move back and forth and they'll just go across the screen or mm -hmm. you'll you'll see a face and then all of a sudden the animation of the mouth it's like that's a completely different artist or right. maybe it's just like three mouth moves you know an o sound and an e sound you know and it's just cycling through those three mouth shapes while it's talking and, and so it's it's like a symbol of walking or a symbol of mm. talking and it's like ah, it's good enough the kids will love it right <laughs> And yeah, right. And uh, yeah, my favorites were always when they'd switched, like the ca the camera angle would switch, and it would it would go from Jack Kirby to Gene Colan, <laughs> so <laughs> and then yes. and then Don Heck, <laughs> and then it was back to Kirby. 
and and then maybe maybe Steve did go, you know. I I mean it it was just it it it's something that you know when you watch those you kind of wonder like yeah they they just they were just thinking let's just make money you know these these Marvel comics are selling really well right now let's you know let let's just uh, let's just do it well we don't have any animators okay. <laughs> we've we got we've got yeah we got people with pens they can trace stuff right <laughs> artists cost money we'll, we'll just uh hire hire a sewer who can cut out the comics yeah. <laughs> so yeah so then we we had a lot of fun uh creating these uh animations of of the doris danger and uh, weren't able to do anything with it, and and we didn't even post them at the time or anything, and it just fizzled, unfortunately. And then and then it mm. sat uh, in in a defunct computer in in the garage for what ten years or something. Um, but then over that time, I was thinking, hey, that was really fun working with Ricky, and uh, you colored all of those, and I thought, and those looked really nice, and uh, so. It, it had me thinking about coloring a Doris Danger book. And the other thing, I don't know if I've mentioned to you, when we were creating those animations, I was trying to come up with stories for the animations. And I, mm. I was writing little kind of mini screenplays. And when nothing happened with those cartoons, I had all these screenplays. And a lot of that wound up being what's in giant monsters amok uh a, a lot of stories that we we kind of started to think about animating and working on and stuff and yeah i think i think i did a i i actually storyboard it somewhere i've got the storyboards for something for you know like a maybe a five minute segment of something yes and that actually is this sequence this uh, oh okay you you have uncredited uh storyboard <laughs> sequences for this sequence of typical the... typical treatment of artists <laughs> in the comic book industry <laughs> yeah and uh so i you know i i've done a, a couple of graphic novels worth of doris danger and one one idea for this third volume was to kind of fill in some holes. And for those of you out there who have never read Doris Danger, the idea is there's a whole stack of decades of Doris Danger comics that, that have just been coming out weekly. And they're just trash, one, one after the other that the publisher is publishing. And so uh, kind of like when I was a kid and when Ricky was a kid, you would go to the supermarket and say, mom, please, I, I want to buy this. And she'd say, all right, put it in the shopping cart. And you'd go home with your one issue. And comics back then, it would start in the middle of a story and the, the character would get out of a uh, cliffhanger. And then some stuff would happen and you might not know all the characters because the story's been running for a few issues. And then the story would end and they're short, you know, 20 pages. So a little bit happens, but it goes pretty fast. And, and then it would end on another cliffhanger. And that was your experience with the comic. And so then the next month you go to the comic, uh, you go to the grocery store or you, you ask, mom, can you take me to the grocery store? And she goes, no, I don't have time. And so maybe the next time you get to the grocery store, it's two or three months later. So you go and you beg to get that issue and your mom buys it for you. But meanwhile, you've missed three issues of the story. So now there's new characters. They're in a new cliffhanger. You never find out how you got out of the previous cliffhanger. And uh, so stories are spotty. And also, it doesn't really matter if, if you missed some of the story, you, you kind of generally know they're, they're going to get out in a, a vaguely, maybe clever way or maybe not. And uh, it, it, it's just over and over again, the, the cycle continues and you, you get the basic idea. Um, every, every issue that whoever the character is in it says, and I am Mr. Zimbabwe, the the ruler of 
you know, this uh, small country. And the reason I'm so evil is, you know, and, and so everything has to be quickly spelled out just so, uh, you know, the, the writers know, oh, you're probably just jumping in for the first time and they, they want to make sure you feel caught up. And so there, there are these sort of odd conventions to the idea of how stories are set up like this. And, um, and I, I was always really fascinated by that. And so Doris Danger in a lot of ways is sort of an exercise in telling stories in that way, instead of just getting on Netflix and watching all 60 episodes in order. It, it's a different way of uh, enjoying stories. And so Doris Danger, it's, it's all these small little five page chapters of seemingly unrelated stories but that as you go start to fill in the spaces and you start to see connections and then and then you you realize oh he said this in this episode because this happened five episodes earlier or whatever and th that's been kind of some of the fun for me of writing doris danger stories and so fanographics doris danger's amok giant monsters amok i thought i'm going to fill in some of these holes and for some of our animations i thought i'm going to fill in some of these holes and uh so that, that was a long explanation, but th this is sort of some of the stuff I'm thinking about creating this book. It was the it, it was the explanation that a villain might give in a comic book <laughs> 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 when, you know, <laughs> when you missed an issue. <laughs> so let me tell you, let me explain to you what uh, what was going on. Uh, but yeah, you're right. I, I mean, that that was. Uh, you know the experience i i think you know for people our age i and also i grew up in a little town in the midwest and there there was not a comic book shop with well the, the nearest comic book shop was you know roughly 50 miles i mean it was it was a it was a big deal to go to the comic book shop and i might get to go you know once a month but uh, otherwise no, I, I got my comics at the drugstore or at a grocery store. And yeah, if you missed something, you you were SOL. And I, I mean, I, I can remember feeling pretty, you know, gloomy about missing stuff and, uh, you know, having to try to go back and, and fill stuff in. But yeah, and, and you're right about how they did that that kind of stilted dialogue with the you, you know the plot points spelled out you know so i, I mean yeah if you, if, to, yeah to right <laughs> right or you know you, you know explaining your motivation yeah. you know and and my favorites were always when they would uh there was one i think where where modok there was an issue of captain america where modok laid out like why he he was he had captain america in a position where he could have killed him and he had to explain why he wouldn't do it. <laughs> and it you know, it was one of those things where, you know, it's it, his humiliation will mean so much more to me than than see, you know, and they 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 have to do those kind of things to explain, like, because within comic books, yeah, you've got, you know, uh, it well, actually, in the what the mid seventies for a while, Marvel had like you know 16 17 pages a month but you do like you know you get like 20 22 maybe 24 issues a month where you had to do that and keep the the cycles going and in order to you know believe the conventions of the story you had to have dialogue and uh, you know word balloons i i loved the, uh, you, you know those word balloons that they would have in the 60s and 70s that were so purple you know and and so full of you know like you might say unnecessary detail and descriptions but you know it gave the it it gave you a it, it gave you more more to read more for your more for your you know 35 cents or whatever uh you know they, they had to do these things to explain why this was just going to keep going on and on and on and why you know these villains they they were going to come back every time and the you know the heroes were always going to get out of it 
Uh, and then the villains got out of, you know, they, they were in jail or they were killed or, you know, so you, you right. expostulate on how that happened. <laughs> right. There's, there's a, you know, a page and a half, two pages right there, you know, and the way that, you know, just the, you know, the story beats, you have to end, you know, every odd page has to, end, you know, have to have the little cliffhanger at the, you know. <laughs> Like to, you want to make sure the reader turns the page so that, you know, you have to do stuff with the dialogue and the word balloons. And yeah, that's what uh, uh, Doris Danger. I, I mean, it's like it's so much of that. It's so much like amped up to, uh, you know, an absurd level it's at times. Steroids. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um. We haven't even started talking about your coloring yet, but uh, we we got a, a decent talk in here. So why don't we sign off and uh, and then we'll log in for a volume two and discuss this actual book and uh, your coloring on it. Oh, OK. Thanks, Ricky. Talk to you in a second. All right. Bye.